Well, um, come on, Sarah, come and share the word of God with us this morning. Give Sarah a warm welcome. I've, you can go on YouTube and listen. I've listened to Sarah's minister numerous times. She is a teacher. She's got this ability just to break things down simply and to instruct people on the Word of God. So you're going to be blessed this morning. And my prayer, because I know what she's, she's preaching on, is that actually you go out of here with hope. Hope. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Is there any chance I can stick this in a doodah? Because I'm not used to holding a microphone. You know, in a mic stand. Sorry. For those who don't know me, I am Sarah, and I'm... Mike and Linda's daughter, middle daughter, so Miriam and Anna's sister. And I go to St. Mark's Church in Dublin, and what we have there is a Britney Spears mic, and I hate it. You know, hooked behind your ears with this little wire. And as much as I hate it, I've just realized I don't think I know how to preach with one hand on a mic. So I panicked a bit there. <laughs> so, oh, thank you, Mark. Now, I'll try and keep my mouth close as well so that you can hear me properly. Uh, Good morning, everybody. I would like to start by saying to, I know this is only very specifically for the four people that were standing up here, that, oh, I've just realized, yeah, you can't move, can you, when you have that? I'm going to keep bringing it around with me. Um, if you don't get the results that you were hoping to get or that you thought you were going to get for your exams, I've been there, and I know exactly how it feels. And you know when something happens and at the time you think this is the worst thing in the world and this is terrible. I didn't get in because physio is hard to get into. You get an offer of a place. If you don't get that place, tough luck. There is no clearance places for physio. So I knew if I didn't get in, I didn't get in. That was it. And I went for my results day. And Linda, my mum, will tell you, while I went to the school to pick up my results... I'm sure it was just you and not dad, decorated the whole driveway with banners, congratulations, balloons, streamers. And I opened that envelope and went, game over. Chemistry let me down. And I was holding in the tears. I thought, just get home. And I would get home and see all of this stuff all down the driveway. Well, it's not for me. There's no congratulations needed here. I'm not going to uni this year. And bless her, mum had hope for the best for me. But I just want to say this, that when you think everything's gone wrong and you think this isn't what was meant to happen, oh no, my plans are kaput. That's when you realise and you look back more with retrospect and you say, God's plans are better than my plans. I thought I had great plans. I thought, you know what, this is where I need to go. This is when I need to go. I need to go and study there. God said, no, no. I have plans for you, because this leads to this, leads to you going to here, meeting these people, which leads you to here, which then leads you to meet this man that's going to become your husband, so you can then go on to have these children, none of which would have happened if my plans succeeded. So when your plans do go awry, and you start to think this is a disaster, can I just say it's never a disaster? It's just God grabbing you and uncomfortably turning you around and saying, no, your plans are terrible. Just trust me, I've got good ones. So if you do get bad results, don't be devastated. I hope you all get good results. I hope you all get everything you want and you get to go where you want. But if you get bad results, I wasn't even going to be saying this, but just while we were praying for you, I just think to say, don't be disappointed. Just know at the back of your mind, his plans are better than my plans. He, I know the thoughts I have for you, he says. And we don't have a mind that can understand God. We don't have a mind. Why is this happening? We've no clue why it's happening. One day we'll find out. Just trust God. So that's the start. I wasn't even meant to say that. But uh, Mark had asked me to speak today, and he said it'll be a surprise for your mom and dad. Um, so there you go. It is a surprise. Um, so they've heard me speak before because I'm part of the teaching team in St. Mark's. Uh, in Dublin, like I said, it's a big Pentecostal church in Dublin. And um, this is my first time to speak in Wellspring. Yeah. I would say my first time to speak in Wales. But if you remember back in the day, 
in Calvary and they used to have the youth group take the Sunday evening. You'll remember service once every so often. So that I, I, w- I would say I probably haven't preached since I was 17 or 18 in Wales. So there we go. I am bringing a message today called Enduring Hope. So Enduring Hope, what I want to say first of all is the hope that we are speaking about today, biblical hope, isn't the hope the way we think of it in the world. So, and please excuse my very dry mouth this morning. When we talk about hope in the world, we say, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Josh will say, I hope Liverpool wins tomorrow, right? Hope, isn't it? It's a fingers crossed, exactly what you've just done. When we talk about hope, we are fingers crossed. It's wishful thinking. Oh, I really hope that doesn't happen. I don't know if it will or it won't, but I just really hope that it doesn't happen. So we've got this little wish that we're pinning without any reassurance or any thought that we've got control over that. So the hope we talk about in the Bible, it's not, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow kind of hope. It's a very different kind of hope. And we're going to talk a bit more about the word that's used and what it means. And the second thing to say is that hopelessness doesn't express Christ. So Christ didn't bring hopelessness. He doesn't give us hopelessness. So if we are living a life of hopelessness and we're expressing hopelessness, I have to start by saying that is not of God. It doesn't express Christ. So enduring hope, which I'm going to speak about today, I'm going to uh, bring the passage Romans 5, 1 to 5. I know you'll all be aware of this passage. So this is going to be like the, the core part of the text. So in Romans 5, 1 to 5, it says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And in the NIV, it uses the word perseverance over the word endurance there. And there's an author, Christian author, Jerry Bridges, and he writes this. Endurance and perseverance are qualities we would all like to possess, but we are loath to go through the process that produces them. I think that is a good point to say, isn't it? You know, these endurance runners, they go out and run two marathons back to back or something. There's a process that they have to go through before they ever attempt to run like that. You are not going to have endurance or perseverance without going through a heck of a process first, right? And another uh, quote from the same author, Jerry Bridges, is this, endurance is the ability to stand up under adversity, Perseverance is the ability to progress in spite of it. And I love that picture, in spite of it, because none of us is going to have a life that's easy sailing, no problems, perfectly happy. There's only one season, and it's the same season all year through. I'm happy, happy, and I have no issues at all. That's not how life works, not for anybody, not for non-believers, not for believers either. So we need perseverance, the ability to progress in our life and through our life's path in spite of everything that's going to come against us and hit us. So I'm going to say this. To, I love plants, right? My husband, if he was here, roll his eyes. He's arriving tomorrow. He'd roll his eyes at this point. I love plants in the house, a bit of indoor gardening, like say a bit of green around my house. But I love particular types of plants. I love cacti, succulents, like desert trees. I love hardy plants. So you know the way you get some plants and after two days they're like, oh, I haven't been misted, I haven't been watered and they're starting to sort of droop. I can't be doing with that. I cannot be doing with those types of plants, but I like plants that thrive and survive. They're hardy. They can take a bit of neglect and a bit of ignoring them. That's the kind of plants I like. These needy plants, I'm like, no, no. I don't even need to say get out of my house because they die, and then they do get out of my house. But I like these hardy plants, like the cacti and the succulents. But the thing you'll notice about them is they will survive long periods of neglect. They really will. 
But what you notice about them when you realise, oh, I've neglected that plant for absolutely ages because it's one that I don't look at very often, they're not thriving. They're not growing. They're not flowering. They'll survive, but they won't thrive. And I'm bringing this up because I feel like we're talking about difficult times and trials in this passage in Romans. We're not just meant to survive the difficult times, but we're meant to thrive in them as well. So it brings us to the passage because the passage is saying suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And what I want to do now is I want to look at the original words that were used in that passage because in one word, there's so much depth. And when I was younger, I used to love, mum will remember this, my nan's house always had a copy of the Reader's Digest. And I used to love picking up the Reader's Digest. Anna's laughing because she probably never looked in it. I was obsessed with spelling, and she always says, you always mocked me about my bad spelling, but I just felt I was trying to teach her. It just didn't go down that well with you, did it? No. So I was a geek for a bit of spelling and a good thesaurus, and there used to be quizzes in the Reader's Digest, you know, which one of these words fits best in that sentence? Because they've got similar meanings, but there's subtle differences where one word will fit better in the sentence. So I think that about when we look at the original words used in the Bible, it's great that we have Bibles that are in English and we can read it and we can understand it. But sometimes if you go a bit deeper and you really look at the meaning of a word, you get even more out of it. So that's what I want to do now. So in that passage, suffering produces endurance. That word suffering, your Bibles might say tribulations. The word that's used originally there, the Greek word is flipsis. So even if you have a lisp, you can say it. Flipsis originally means Pressure, tribulation, affliction, trouble, anguish, persecution, burdened, anything that burdens the spirit. So is it fair to say that whatever circumstance you find yourself in at the moment, whatever trial you're going through, whatever situation you're in, that could be describing it, one of those words. So suffering, what you're going through, the, the, the thing that's burdening your spirit leads to endurance. Your Bibles might say patience or perseverance at that point. So it's leading to this Greek word, hupomone, which originally means cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, patience, patient continuance, patient waiting. And it comes from a root word for abiding under. So this is a patience that grows only under trial, under difficulty. So there's this amazing quote from Strong's Concordance. It says this, Hupomone is the temper which does not easily succumb under suffering. It's the opposite of cowardice or despondency. So endurance, we're saying our trials, our suffering, the thing we're going through, the burden that's on us, leads to this Hupomone. It's a kind of temperament in you that you're cheerfully and hopefully enduring because it's growing underneath your pressure, underneath your problems. Can we honestly say that we are practicing that positive patient endurance in our life in the trials that we go through? That's a challenge to me as much as anyone. Because that endurance leads to what the scriptures told us, it leads to character. Your Bible might say experience, depending on what version you read, or it might say approvedness. The Greek word used originally there is dokime meaning the process of proving, like through an experiment or a trial. And when you look at the dictionary definition of prove, it's this, to establish the truth or genuineness of, as by evidence or argument, so to establish the authenticity or validity of something. What's the word we think of with proving? Metal proving, isn't it? So there's a process, there's an industrial process, metal proving, and it's tough and it's abrasive. And what it does is it reveals the true character of the metal. So if the trials that we go through are suffering, we're supposed to suffer them in cheerful patience so as to prove our character, like proving precious gold, our authenticity, because it leads to, what did the scripture say? It leads to hope. So our suffering leads to an endurance that grows, a patient hopefulness that grows under our suffering, which leads to character, that is us going through a proving process, showing our mettle, leading to hope. And the Greek word used is elpis, meaning, doesn't mean fingers crossed, I'm making a wish, I hope. It means to anticipate with pleasure, expectation, confidence. 
That's very different from the way we use the word hope, isn't it? In Strong's Concordance, it says this, a favorable and confident expectation, a forward look with assurance. That's our hope. Our hope is in the promises of God. So tribulations, then, it's saying, are our means of exercising and increasing our patience. It doesn't feel nice to go through a tribulation, as we all know. But we've got to look at what it's doing for us. So we're going through this purifying process, this refining process, like the testing of gold. And don't we sometimes sing that, that song, refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy. It's that purifying that, that, that we're talking about here. So there's a line in Clark's commentary that I love, and it was, this was written in 1800, talking about hope, talking about the word elpis. This hope prevents us from dreading coming trials. We receive them as means of grace and find that all things work together for good to them that love God. This is a real reaffirming things we've even heard this morning here. This is a hope that prevents us from dreading trials. We receive them as if they were a gift because all things work together for those who love the Lord. So I'm going to veer off at a complete angle here now and talk about bony anatomy. Caris will love this because she'll know all this as well. Bony anatomy. You're going to say, where is she going with this? Now, having studied anatomy, I did eventually get into physio. I better add that for those that thought I just dropped out of school and then went, oh, I never got in the first time. I had to keep going. When I studied anatomy, when you study human anatomy and physiology at degree level and at master's level, you get the opportunity to be blown away by God's design skill. And I mean blown away because the processes that are happening in our body are incredible. The design skills are phenomenal. So bones are made up of bone trabeculae. This is a structure in our bone. So there's these sort of holes connected by thin rods of bone tissue, these plates of bone tissue, and it makes a kind of a web. And then in the holes is where your bone marrow resides, so you can make your blood cells. But the way bone is structured, this kind of mesh, this web, is it's structured that way so that it can give you maximum strength with minimal mass. Right, so in other words, strong bones without lugging around a dead weight, a lead weight. So you could say, wouldn't it be great if my bones were made of lead because they'd be really strong and they would, you know, you could be hit by a car and nothing would happen. Well, imagine your bones were made of lead. You'd be, it'd take forever to get anywhere. You'd have no agility to avoid something coming your way because you're so heavy. So God's got this design in the bone. I'm going to make it really light so we can hop, jump, dance, skip, but it's going to be really strong at the same time. It'll take a few knocks. Bone structure becomes thicker and denser to resist external loads. This is going to become clear soon enough. So anybody who's done martial arts in here will understand this process. Like when you're blocking with the blade of your arm, right? So when you first start, you're blocking kicks, you're blocking punches, you're using this, what we call the blade of the ulna. And the bone is taking so many knocks, it's black and blue the whole way from top to bottom because it's not used to taking that kind of pressure, abuse, going through such horrible trials, right? And it is getting battered and bruised. Over time, pressure loading on bone leads to its strengthening. What you get is a really strong, knobbly, bobbly, gnarly feeling forearm bone that can take any hits. You could be kicked or punched as hard as anything, and it doesn't even bruise anymore because it's toughened up, because that's how bone works. External load pressure leads to its strengthening. So why am I telling you this in the middle of this message about hope? Loading impact leads to a stress response in bone, which in turn strengthens it. Your bones need stress to stay strong. Here's an interesting fact. One of the biggest limitations to human space exploration, would you believe, is our bones. Because there is a 2% bone loss for every month that you spend in space. So all of these um, space exploration bodies, NASA and all the other ones, they do all this research. They pump a huge amount of money into research. And how are we going to get around this? Because we need to explore, well, so they say, far and wide. And we're in space for ages. 
But a big problem is these guys are coming back with osteoporosis, young, healthy, fit men, because you will lose the bones. After six months in space, it takes four years for your bones to return back to normal, just because of what? So bones are weaker because they're not being piled on, stressed, and put under pressure. So they're strengthened by the stress and the pressure, which makes me think of how our hope grows. Our hope grows through our suffering, through the pressure, through that abuse of all these trials we go through, which leads to perseverance, which leads to character, which leads to hope. So I want to say these two things. There's a first thing is there is a positive outcome to your suffering. We will all go through different trials. People here are all going through their own different trials at the moment. But first thing to say, there's a positive outcome to your suffering. We can see what it will bring about in your life. And the second point is rejoice in it. We're told this is like a gift. How is it like, like a gift? Because only through it will you develop hope. The next thing I'm going to say is about the New Testament upping the ante, to use a, a, a phrase that maybe not everybody uses. But when you up the ante, it means, ah, oh, I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to go that one step further than anyone else. The New Testament really ups the ante on our behavior. So we know in the Old Testament, we are told, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The New Testament really kind of ups the ante on it. It's, if you so much as look at something your neighbor has and wish that you had it, you may as well have gone and stolen it off. If you so much as look at another man's wife, another woman's husband, with a lustful eye, you may as well have gone the whole hog and committed adultery. It's like upping the ante all the time. And I think the upping of the ante that we get here in this passage is about how we behave when we're going through hardships. Christians should have better resilience than non-believers. Am I right? Yeah. Why? Why should we have better resilience? There's so many reasons. So we know we're loved by the Almighty. We know we're forgiven. We've got a promise of eternal life in heaven with God. And we know this passage. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. We've got thousands of promises in the scriptures from God, enough for multiple ones each day of the year. That's, that's a good reason for us to have some resilience, to have some bounce back ability when problems come our way, when trials and difficulties come our way. Here's another big one. We have the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. We have the Holy Spirit, the wind, the spirit of Almighty God. In the New Testament, one of the words used for the Holy Spirit is parakletos. Jesus said this, but when the comforter, Parakletos, comes, who I will send to you from the Father. Listen to this definition of that word Parakletos that's used there. This is from Strong's Concordance. An intercessor, consoler, advocate, comforter. This word is used of the Holy Spirit destined to take the place of Christ after his ascension and lead them to a deeper knowledge of the gospel truth here and give them divine strength needed to enable them to undergo trials and persecutions. We haven't been left alone. We haven't been told to rough it out through our trials all in our own strength. We've been left with the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the wind of almighty God to see us through these trials. That's, that to me is a big reason why we should be far better equipped when, when tough times come our way as believers. That's why we should have better resilience. We are not getting through because we're brave or we're strong. We're getting through these trials because we've got the power of the Holy Spirit, which was sent to assist us. And as we've seen in that quote there, to give us the divine strength needed so we can undergo these trials. But wait a second. I did say Romans 5 up the ante, didn't I? So here we go. Romans 5 says about our trials, we glory in tribulations. I'm going to read a few versions of the Bible where, where it's what it's saying in the different versions. We rejoice in our trials and suffering. We gladly suffer. We are happy with the troubles we have. We have joy with our troubles. Ah, here. Steady on. This is a lesson for me also, guys. This, you know, you're saying, I just about come to terms with this idea that 
I will have trials, but I'll get through them. The Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit's here to help me. But it's up in the ante and saying to me, not just that, be delighted with the troubles that come your way. Yes, everything's gone wrong. Yes, I've lost my job. I've got no income. Can't find another one. Things that have happened to me. We're supposed to be delighted with these things that come our way, these trials. Why? Why rejoice about them? Why is the Bible telling us to rejoice because we're going through a horrible time? Because we know that through these trials, we are growing our endurance, our patience. And when we do that, we are proving our character, proving like precious metal to show our true nature and brilliance that God's put in us. And we know that that leads to hope. So what it's saying is your trials and your problems It's the fertilizer, the growing ground. It's the grow bag that your hope is going to grow up out of. So I think that's that's significant, isn't it? If we want to be people of hope and have a powerful biblical hope in us, it's clearly telling us in Romans where that's going to come from. You will go through trials and rough times. But you know what? There's a process that leads to this, that leads to this, that leads to this. There's the grow bag. Your hope is going to grow out of those difficult times. And recently I was praying, and it wasn't even to do with the message, but I was praying in my prayer time, and and God gave me a picture in my mind. I know the way God gives you a picture that you'll understand as well. So I understood the reference. It was a picture of a mall, a rugby mall. And I put up some pictures uh, so that you'd be able to see People who don't know anything about rugby, I'll give a quick explanation as to what a mall is. Even people who watch rugby might be like, I always wondered kind of what the mall was about. So when you're going into a tackle playing rugby, if you're a tackle to the ground, then the player's coming in over you. That's a rock, and that's a breakdown area. But if you go into the tackle and no one puts you down and you're still on your feet trying to move your legs and your mates come behind you to give you some support, but the opposition have come up from the other side, the ref will call a mall. And once you're moving, that's a rolling mall. And there are rules around what you can and can't do in pulling that down. So two of the greatest players to ever help control a rolling mall, you see on the screen, Paul O'Connell of Ireland and Alan Wynne-Jones of Wales. Two of the greatest men to control. Mum's delighted there was a Welsh man in there. And I'm not being biased either, living in Ireland and being Welsh by birth. They are two of the greatest men to ever control a rugby mall. You'll always see a fella sticking out the top in a rugby mall. And he's got a job to do. So he's got to try and keep control of the mall. And as it's moving, he's trying to grab people. He's trying to keep the the mall nice and tight. He's trying to protect the ball carrier who's hiding in that pack somewhere. He has to know what's going on. And there's so much happening. It's so busy. He's grabbing here. He's pulling here. He's preventing it from turning and being spun around because that's another issue can happen. He is trying to, if he can, peel off opposition players and throw them. So you'll see them working so hard. Where is everyone? What am I doing? What do I need to control? I have to control absolutely everything. And the reason God gave me that picture is because he was like, that's you with your struggles, Sarah. I don't know if anyone else is like me. That's you going, I have to control everything. I need to keep my hand on everything and control everything. And it is stressful and it's too much for your head. And that was me as I was praying. And God gave me that picture as if, look, look what you're at. And I said, you know what, Lord, I don't want to be like that. I don't want that to be me. I want to let go and trust fall into your Holy Spirit. I got a picture in my mind of the Holy Spirit being like a big, massive, squashy, comfy beanbag. And it doesn't matter. I don't know. I trust. I've got hope that if I just let go of everything I'm hanging on to and trust fall back into the Holy Spirit, I have a hope in me that I will be caught held, cushioned, and minded by the Holy Spirit. And that's our hope to me. So when I was writing the message, I was thinking of that incident that had happened in my prayer time and going, yeah, that's, that's our hope, is I feel like I have to cling on to everything and control every variable. Oh, I can't let go, I can't let go, I have to control it all. Me letting go is against my inner nature, but I'm saying I put my hope in you. If I let go of everything and stop trying to control everything, hope tells me that you'll catch me, that you've got it, that I can let go, release everything, leave it to you because you never let me down. That's our hope. And there's a, there's a, a writer, John Bunyan, that said, hope is never ill. 
when faith is well. If we have our faith, we can have hope. And in Job 11, verse 18, it says, You will be secure because there is hope. You will look about you and take your rest in safety. The original Hebrew word used for hope there is actually a word tikvah. And it means a cord, like a bound cord, an attachment or a rope. And I love that picture, that we can hang tightly onto that rope. Whatever we're going through, like a climber, we can hang onto that rope because that's our hope. You will be secure because there's hope. Here's another great mental picture of our hope in Hebrews 6.19. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. There's that picture again. What, what's an anchor doing? When the storms come, when we're buffeted by the difficulties that we have in life, the anchor is what holds us steady. And that's the verse telling us we have this hope as an anchor. Whatever storm, whatever buffet comes along, we are anchored. That's our hope, firm and secure. And here's the best bit. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to conjure it up or do any work for it. This hope is a gift. In Psalm 62, 5, it says, yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. David is commanding himself there. My soul, I'm talking to you. Find rest in God. My hope comes from him. So what do we need to grasp in order to take hold of the hope that's offered to us? One, his unfailing love. Two, the truth of the cross. And three, the encouragement in the scriptures. I would encourage you this morning, if you feel like you need encouragement, bury your head in the scriptures. Bury your head in the scriptures. Because it's very easy to come to church and go, I need encouragement from people. I need people to encourage me. But you know what can happen? People can be busy. People can be about to come and talk to you and they got pulled off by a grandchild or a child. Don't come to church going, I need encouragement. Somebody better encourage me because I'm going to tell you this. The best place to find it is in the scriptures. If you need encouragement, bury your head in the scriptures because they're chock full of it. If we don't wholeheartedly believe in this, then we, we can't live it and we can't walk it. And I want to ask, do we ever look at ourselves or at another Christian and think, why are they so hopeless when they've got Christ? And I want to ask this question this morning. Is it the weeds choking the word? So, you know, when we hear the parable of the sower and we think that this is just for people who've heard the scriptures for the first time. That's the way we've always thought of the parable of the sower. Somebody's been given the, the gospel. They've never heard it before. What happens? Does it fall on rough ground? Does it, does it fall amongst weeds and thorns? Can I suggest this morning we have a little look at it in the context of what we're saying? So we have the word of God, the seed. In that parable, the word of God is the seed, right? So we have the seed, the word of God, and it promises us hope. We've seen that. It promises that he will be with us through it all. But sometimes when the weeds... And the scripture there is the troubles, the worries spring up around us. They choke the seed, the word of God, so that we forget the promise of hope through our trials, through our adversities. I'll read Matthew 13 there now, 20 to 22. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at once and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the weeds refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word. So if we're hopeless in our troubles and we've got Christ, I want to ask, are we letting the weeds choke the word? The weeds, the worries and the difficulties we go through, are we letting it choke the word? Because the word clearly tells us hope is to be found in God. So if if you think you are doing that, if you think you have let the weeds choke the word a bit, if I can encourage you to use a beautiful scouse phrase to give your head a wobble. Give your head a wobble means to change the way you think about things and to give yourself a good talking to. I'm a big fan of giving myself a good talking to because I have to do it quite often. It's better that than my husband trying to give me a good talking to. I don't cope so well with that. Give your head a wobble. Give yourself a talking to. David, in Psalm 42.5, I think he perfectly encapsulates this 
duality, this two-sidedness that we can often have. He says this in 42.5 in the Psalms. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I love that, that he has given his own head a wobble. David is a man who knew trials and persecutions. People were coming for him. He was hiding in caves. People wanted him dead. They were trying to kill him. And clearly, there were times then, going by this, where he felt low and downcast and disturbed in his soul. But he gave his head a wobble. He talks to himself. Put your hope in God. Because I can say this to you. We can all experience speed wobbles in our faith. We really can. In our strength, our hope can go through a bit of a speed wobble. But we can be like David. We can give our head a wobble, talk to ourselves, encourage ourselves with the scriptures. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. I love it. And in Romans 15, verse 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. We might have hope. That's what the scriptures are even there for. Everything that's been written in the scriptures is to teach us through endurance in the scriptures. The encouragement that's in there, we might have hope. That encouragement that you need is in your Bibles. And I just want to uh, bring up the lyrics of a song that I am loving lately. And I don't know if you sing it here. Do you sing Song of Ascent? If you don't mind me reading the lyrics to this song. Every time I, I, I play it, I just, I'm blown away by the concept that's in there that sometimes we can forget. It starts like this. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you graced the other side. Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. In the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing. You're just not that hard to find. So I will praise you on the mountain and I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. You're no less God within the shadows, no less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is, in the highlands and the heartache, all the same. It goes on, the song, but I love that reminder. He's no less God when you're in the shadows, in the valley, in that rough place. He's the same God as when you're having the time of your life, everything's going well, and you're on the mountaintop. He's consistent. He is constant. So whether you're having a great time in life or whether you're having the worst time of your life, he is no less God in either of those places. He is still the same God. And when it says, where's that line that I absolutely love? Yeah, you're the summit where my feet are. In the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. That might sound a bit harsh on the surface. Oh, but when I'm in the heartaches, when I'm having a terrible time, you're no more inclined towards me, Lord. That's not a negative. What it's reminding us is the constancy of God. He doesn't lose his inclination towards us because we're having a great time. And actually, the happiness we're feeling about a new baby and a new job and a new house, oh, sure, I don't need to incline my heart towards them. Aren't they having a lovely time anyway? His love for us, his heart being inclined towards us is so constant that it doesn't change. doesn't matter if you're right up on the mountaintop, the best time of your life, or you're at the bottom of the valley surrounded by shadows. He is still there. He's still constant. His love for you hasn't changed and his heart's still inclined towards you, irrespective of where you are. And I love that reminder because that's our, that feeds our hope. Whatever you're in, whatever you're going through, his heart's still inclined towards you. He still loves you. He's still every much, he's still every bit as much God as he ever was in that time. So to finish out now, I'm going to read Ephesians 1.18. And 
This is a prayer even towards you. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's a prayer for all of us, including me here today, that our eyes of our heart will be open to know the hope to which we've been called. Because it's not easy to have hope sometimes in this world when we see darkness and we're struggling and it's tough. But we need to know the hope that he has called us to. And I'm going to pray this prayer as an end into this message. I'm going to pray Romans 15, 13 over you. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Do you know what? As a as a pastor or a father or when you find yourself in a position, sometimes you just know people are going through things, right? You've just had, we've just had, folks, a wonderful explanation from the teaching from the scripture that actually there's strength to be gained from the struggle. The strength to be gained from the struggle so I can face tomorrow without fear, but in faith, that's hope. That's hope. And uh, I, I, you, I'm aware, you know, some people, you, if you're visiting this morning or if you don't know of everything this morning, there are people struggling in our church. They're struggling. Jeanette was very honest today. I don't know if you've picked up that struggle. It's difficult. Um, Felicity, not here. We're gonna. She's, you know, that, that that bombshell dropped on Laura this week. Felicity's not here. I'm aware of that as a pastor. Oh my God. And there's John and there's Paula struggling, facing these things. And sometimes I wish I could just turn up and go, God, just come on, do it. All I'm selling you is this. And this is what I was reminded of when Jesus knew that a guy called Peter was about to face something. He knew he was about to face a desperate trial of his faith. And he was, his pride was going to be smashed to the floor because he said, Jesus, I won't forsake you. Jesus said, okay, I know what's coming. You're going to struggle. But Peter, I've prayed for you. Oh God, can't you take it away? Just stop it. Jesus, can't you just tell me what's going to happen? Tell me how I can solve it all and I don't have to go through it. That's what I want. Thank you. Amen. No, no. Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. We're praying for you. We're praying for the church. We're praying for one another. Be hopeful. Be hopeful. Be hopeful in Jesus' name. Be hopeful. Amen? Amen. Sarah, that was incredible. Honestly, I really enjoyed, not just enjoyed, but was encouraged. Amen? Amen. <laughs>